Welcome everybody, in this video we will take a close look at the strain tensor in continuum mechanics and how it can be visualized. Let's consider a problem in continuum mechanics. The displacement field U, which gives us the displacement of matter at each point in space, is a vector field, which can be visualized by picking a few points in the matter and drawing the corresponding displacement vectors at these points. In contrast to the displacement field, the strain field epsilon is a tensor field. Illustrating a tensor field is not as straightforward as illustrating a vector field, but in this video I will show you a nice way to illustrate the strain tensor field. The strain tensor is the symmetric part of the gradient of the displacement field. Because it is symmetric, the strain tensor has a total of six independent components. First, let's see if we can visualize these six components at a single point in matter. To illustrate strain at a single point in the continuum, we cut out a tiny volume element at this point. This volume element is so tiny that we call it an infinitesimal element. In fact, let's assume here that the infinitesimal element is so small that the strain is constant over the element. Let's take a look at the strain tensor when all components except the epsilon11 component are zero. The epsilon11 component is the derivative of the first component of the displacement field in x1 direction. Now the question arises if we can construct a displacement field over the infinitesimal element such that all components except the epsilon11 component are zero and the epsilon11 component is constant. Let's arbitrarily choose the value 0.3 for epsilon11. The displacement field that we are looking for can be constructed by choosing the first component of the displacement field to be linear in x1 direction. That is 0.3 times x1 in this case. We can illustrate the displacement field over the infinitesimal element and we can illustrate the resulting deformation. We observe that the element elongates in x1 direction. A value of 0.3 for epsilon11 means that the element elongates by 30%. We can do the same for the epsilon22 component and observe that we get an elongation in x2 direction. Finally, for the epsilon33 component, we get an elongation in x3 direction. Let's move on with the epsilon12 component. Once again, let's define a displacement field such that epsilon12 is constant and takes the value 0.3 over the element, and all other components of the strain tensor are zero. If you like, pause the video and try on your own to find a displacement field that corresponds to such a state of strain. But be aware that there are multiple possible answers. Okay, here's a displacement field that leads to epsilon12 being constant. We observe that the element stretches in the direction that is oriented with a 45 degree angle between x1 and x2, and it squeezes in the direction that is oriented with a 45 degree angle between x1 and minus x2. A value of 0.3 for epsilon12 means that the diagonal plane that is aligned with a 45 degree angle between x1 and x2 elongates by 30%. Finally, we can do similar considerations for the strain components epsilon13. And epsilon23. So now we have a good understanding of the meaning of each component of the strain tensor. As you can see, the first three components and the latter three components show a somewhat similar behavior. We call the first three components, which are the diagonal elements of the strain tensor, the normal strains. And the other three components, which are the off-diagonal elements of the strain tensor, the shear strains. Now, this illustration of the strain tensor components is really helpful. But there is one tiny thing that I don't like so much about it. We chose a cube as an infinitesimal element. That means we had to decide how the cube is oriented in the coordinate system x1, x2 and x3. Consequently, illustrating the same strain in two different coordinate systems would look different. To avoid this, we can choose another shape for the infinitesimal element, 
A sphere is a good choice because it is invariant to coordinate transformations. Finally, until now, we have only considered individual components of the strain tensor. The deformation arising from the entire strain tensor is the superposition of the deformations of all its individual components. Let's take an example where we set all components to zero except for epsilon 1 1 and epsilon 2 3. The infinitesimal element stretches in x1 direction and shears in the x2 and x3 plane. Until now, we have only considered strains at one point in matter. In continuum mechanics, however, we are interested in physical quantities at each point in the continuum. That is, we are interested in illustrating the strain tensor field. Of course, we cannot illustrate the strain tensor at infinitely many points in the domain. What we can do, however, is to pick a few points and illustrate infinitesimal elements at these points. Of course, we have to magnify these elements for illustrational purposes, otherwise they wouldn't be visible. When the matter is deforming, the strain tensor changes at each point in space, which is reflected in the deformation of the infinitesimal elements. For the example that is shown here, where I have chosen a dog bone shaped solid, we can nicely observe that we obtain larger strains at the narrow part of the dog bone shape and smaller strains elsewhere. I hope you could develop some intuition about how the strain tensor can be visualized. Stay tuned for future videos. Bye!